Hello um, to this first post that I'm contributing to a new website, which are obviously on right now, if you're watching this, it's called Dialectical Systems. And it deals with uh, the, the, the organization of, of living organisms, um, systems that have this particular structure of living agents. What we're gonna do today uh, is, uh, I'm gonna have a chat with Yanni Hofmeier, who I met during uh, one of my best years of my life in, in uh, Berlin at the Wissenschaftskolleg, the Institute for Advanced Study, where Yanni and I uh, met each other. And um, he was interested as a biochemist uh, in the organization of, of, of the cell. Um, and he was studying Robert Rosen, which will be a big sort of part of the conversation today. And uh, Rosen is a controversial um, sometimes member of the field. And we're going to talk today with Yanni about why Rosen is so important still today to the field and um, how this relates to Yanni's work. Um, this is going to be a multi-part um, uh, interview. And the first part is sort of an introduction to Yanni and uh, the work of Robert Rosen. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, give you the word, Yanni, if you could tell us a little bit um, about the background and why a biochemist would be interested uh, in relational biology and Robert Rosen. Thanks, Yogi. Yeah, you reminded me of a very nice year that we had together. And actually also the time that you spent here at, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Stellenbosch, STIAS, where I'm actually at, I'm retired now. So I have an office at home, which is very noisy today. So they kindly allowed me to come back to my old office here at STIAS when we started off. Um, and so it's a nostalgic moment for me as well. So where do I come from? So I'm, a, as you said, a biochemist. I, I studied in the 70s. I was thrown into the deep end very quickly to, to lecture all of metabolism, intermediate metabolism. And there I realized that things didn't gel for me when we started talking about how these metabolic pathways are regulated. And in the late 70s, I discovered the work of, of Henry Katcher and Jim Burns, um, who developed at that time in Edinburgh something called metabolic control analysis, but which was also at the same time in Berlin by Tom Rappaport and Reinhard Heinrich. They also developed the same sort of formalism. So it, as often these things happen, so serendipity that two groups completely ignorant of each other develop the same ideas. Um, and this, oh, this just was shone a light on the whole thing for me. So the control, the paper was called The Control of Flux. And one of the most important ideas that came from that is that the old classical regulation idea that there must be a rate limiting step in a pathway um, was shown to be false. There's no reason whatsoever for, for the necessity for a rate limiting step. In fact, control is shared across all the, or can be shared across all the, the steps in the system. And the control analysis allows us to quantify that. So that for me was a, was a revelation. And I realized that if I want to understand what happens in metabolic pathways, I better find a way of, of, of modeling it because experimentally at, that, at that, that time, it was extremely difficult to do the sort of experiments that I would want to do, you know, specifically manipulating the concentration of one enzyme. I mean, at that, stage, at that stage, we couldn't do it. Now, of course, you can overexpress it and it's no problem. Um, so I bought myself probably the most primitive computer that existed at that time. It was the ZX81. And uh, you had a little touch sensitive thing. You had to connect with a long cable to your TV screen. And I taught myself to program. So the idea was that I wanted to be able to simulate the dynamic behavior of, of metabolic pathways. And this went on throughout the 80s. I spent some time with my colleague, Ethel Cornish Bowden, who was a, a, a long collaborator, long time collaboration that I had after that with him, and also spent some time with Henry Katcher and developed a program called Metamod, which allowed me to do the modeling, dynamic modeling, steady state modeling, and control analysis. And so this allowed me to, to really ask what if questions about how, how does metabolic regulation work. And I think the most important bit came here in the early 90s when together with Ethel Cornish Bowden, we realized that there was a big problem in how metabolic systems had been originally studied. 
in the in in the sense that because of the complexity of of uh, of the metabolic pathways, people isolate experimentally or in their minds they isolate some part of it and study that on its own. So, for instance, you want to study the the production of some other amino acid, then you study the biosynthetic pathway of the amino acid. So that's also the way it's described in textbooks. So you, you, know, you have a ch chapter on amino acid metabolism, as, as if that is, as if amino acid is the end product of everything. But of course, that's nonsense. The amino acid is an intermediary that is then used by a system which appears 10 chapters later in the textbook, namely protein synthesis. So the two are not connected, also not in the minds of biochemists, apparently. And so we realized that if you want to study the, the regulation of, a, of a, say, a biosynthetic pathway, you have to take the demand for the product of that pathway into consideration as well. And on the basis of that, we developed what is called supply-demand analysis. And the, the important finding that came from that, if you study, if you look at biosynthetic pathways, there is no control of the flux through that pathway by enzymes within the pathway. The, the control over that pathway, of the flux of that pathway lies in the demand for the product. And it turns out then that because all of these pathways are usually end product regulated, so there's, the, say the amino acid feeds back onto the committing enzyme, allosteric enzyme, usually the first, the first in, the, in the pathway. And classically, the idea in regulation was that this is there to regulate the flux. But what it turns out that if the control of the flux lies in the demand, then the function of the allosteric feedback loop is to, is to determine the homeostatic maintenance of the concentration of the amino acid. And so that's a complete turnaround of what the classical regulation idea was. So that was for us very important. And, and, and it was, of course, gratifying that soon after we published our, our, our basic description of supply demand analysis, there was quite a number of papers that corroborated what we said experimentally. So we predicted that control would lie outside of intermediate metabolism. Um, and it turned out to be that way. So that was for me very important. And it was an, an introduction to this idea of thinking in terms of function. Right, so that's the that's key word, yeah. Function is the key word here for me, at least, was. And that is what happened when, in about 1995, I walked into a little bookshop here in Stellenbosch and there was on the shelf, as I said, uh, there were the books were where, which, which defied the classification system of the, of the proprietors of this bookshop, little German bookshop, wonderful place, it doesn't exist anymore. But there was this book, Life Itself, by Robert Rosen, stuck in amongst other books which had nothing to do with it. And I'd heard of Rosen before because I, in the 70s, published a book called Dynamical Systems uh, in, in biology or something. I can't remember the exact title, but it was about dynamical systems theory, more classical. The stuff that I'd been doing for donkey's years. And I took this book home and I read it and it just blew my mind because I think my mind was ready for that book. People say, no, you can't read Rose and it's too difficult and that don't make sense. For me, it made absolute sense, although the mathematics didn't because I didn't know anything about category theory at that stage. I had learned matrix algebra and, 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 and you know, systems of differential equations. That was the sort of bread and butter for me. Category theory was an was a alien animal for me. And of course, Rosen uses that. But the ideas in that book just blew my mind because it just gelled exactly with what I was thinking. We have to think about functional organization in metabolism or in the cell for that matter, if we want to understand what makes something, what makes that cell living, what makes an, organize, an, an, an uh, organism living. So for me, when I read that book, uh, it opened a whole new research field. But it was something that you did at night, of course. Now you didn't dare say anything about this during the day at work. So this was sort of nighttime work. And then I had the good fortune of getting an award, the Harry Oppenheimer Award, which allowed me in 2004 to spend a whole year just thinking about these things. And for me, that was then the turnaround in my research career when I really started to understand what Rosen was saying. Um, and yeah, it took a long time after that. I mean, 20 years, nearly 20 years before I really, really understood what was going on. But we're going to talk about that. But just a not so short intro to where I got to Rosen. This is great. So um, 
the keyword, as we said, is functional thinking. And you, you already hinted at um, th these aspects that are not, for example, in metabolic regulation, that are not um, immediately obvious, that are a bit higher, higher level. If, if you're, you have to consider the whole system. So we're really, I, we're talking about a true systems biology here. Uh, I would say that's one aspect that I, I would like to point out. And the other one that, that it's about uh, supply and demand is all about um, dynamics, right? It's, it's, uh, uh, it's a very different sort of way of thinking about metabolism than, than these sort of static network diagrams that we see in, in textbooks. Um, so you said it, it took 20 years. You published uh, with Olaf uh, Wolkenhauer uh, the early, some early work in, in the early in, in the mid noughties, I think. Um, um, but really, um, what we're going to talk about today are a series of papers um, that will be shared uh, below uh, in this blog. We'll, we'll provide the links that you've published about sort of translating Rosen into the real world, right? So maybe we can say a bit more about Rosen and also his student, uh, Aloysius uh, Louis, and, and their work, and um, why it is a bit. Uh, sort of abstract and and that's maybe why it hasn't sort of caught on and then we can sort of uh, uh find an entry point into your efforts to connect it to to the everyday work of the biochemist i guess is that um sort of a roadmap that appeals to you absolutely so so you mentioned olaf of course olaf is a very good friend of mine and and, and, and we collaborated we talked about i mean evenings and evenings spent on trying to figure this out. He wrote a few very, very good papers about explaining Rosen. And also the idea of closure to efficient causation, which is something that we will come to later, which is, of course, the central concept in, in Rosen's ideas of organisms and complexity as well. Right. Let's dive right in. And, and you were mentioning that Rosen, some people find him difficult to read because he uses something called category theory. And we're not going to go into the mathematical detail, but uh, details, but we're basically going to use a bit of, of, of the formalism um, of that as well. And, and maybe we could, could start by, by just saying uh, a little bit um, uh, about these, these sort of diagrams that we, we'll, we'll show a few examples afterwards. But before yeah. we show them, I think we have to have a word of warning that there's a whole lot of complexity hidden in those very simple, um, uh, simple uh, 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 graphs of mappings and and in particular I want to start um, coming back to this functional the keyword of function and the distinction maybe you can say um, um, a few things at the very beginning about the distinction that Rosen is making about the, the semantics and the syntax that that enters his formalism that is represented in there uh, uh, maybe it's a little bit too early let us get to that when, when we're looking at the mappings themselves, because I think without a diagram, sometimes these things are a little bit vague in my, in my head as well. So we just, let's just get back to this idea of relational biology and category theory. I think that's an important point to make is that mathematics, of course, the foundations of mathematics for most people, most mathematicians, is set theory where the most important thing is to belong to a set, membership of a set. Whereas with category theory, which was developed by, by, by Ehrenberg and uh, what's his, uh, McLean, Eilenberg and McLean in the forties, the idea there is that the, 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 it's not so important to belong to a set. What is important is to look at the relationship between sets. So the whole idea of category theory has to do with relations between objects. And so that is the primary thing in, in, a, in a category is the idea of a relation and the, or a mapping and the, the beauty that you can compose mappings so that you can build up a picture of mappings connected to each other gives you an idea of the organization in, let's call it a functional organization. We're gonna use that term a lot inside that system. So that is the beauty of category theory. It's also now people, you know, have, have raised it to the level where it's an alternative foundation for, for mathematics. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming more and more and more used after being an abstract, you know, some people called it abstract nonsense um, for a long while. Rosen actually was the first, the first non, let, let's say, non-pure mathematician, applied mathematician that used it outside of pure mathematics. Mm -hmm. 
So his application in the late 1950s, 1958, 1959, was it with the original papers. That was really the first time that, ever, that, that somebody outside of pure mathematics used category theory. Of course, it went completely unnoticed at that stage, um, as so often as somebody who was long before his time. So, so it, it, was, it was later. It was later picked up by Ms. Harovich and, and Takahara and people who were at the, the beginning of um, systems yeah. theory, but but also very sort of fringe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Michael I would say fringe. and these people, yeah. No, yeah. that was quite a bit later. So the idea the 70s, of, of yeah. Yeah, well, late 60s, 70s, yeah. yeah. So, so the idea of relational biology, which uses the category of sets and mappings now, um, actually started with, with the Rosen supervisor, Nicholas Rashevsky. Um, but Rosen developed it much further, and, uh, you, and you mentioned then Aloysius Louis, who was Rosen's PhD student, who did some brilliant work, but then for a long time didn't work in this field. But after Rosen's death in, in the late 90s, he sort of took on, you know, took up the, the reins again and developed the relational biology to a very, very high degree of, of mathematical finesse um, in his three books that he's published up to now. You, you maybe put the titles later, but Aloysius has really done, done an enormous amount of work to, to place relational biology on a really satisfying mathematical footing. But the problem is, again, it's, it's the mathematical, the formal side of, of, of relational biology. The idea is that you actually start with a model and then you look for a realization of that model after you've made it. And that is probably why it hasn't taken off because it's difficult to, 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 to compare, you know, what happens in the mathematics, what happens in the real world. There must be some other link. And perhaps this is a good point to put up the first slide, which I think is, I'm going to talk about a few things that I think Rosen really, really contributed. So, you were saying that it's it's all about uh, relations, and and in Rosen's formalism, there there uh, he treats the organization of the organism in this way. But um, we'll start by taking even a further step back, and, and he he's also treating the relation between a model and the real world, so to say, uh, in yeah. this way. And this is something that's often misunderstood, and we want to talk a little bit about it to begin with. It's called uh, Rosen's modeling relation, and and uh, here yeah. I'm showing your slide that shows the diagram that Rosen uses. So Rosen here said we have to, you know, we have to go into the, the, the dusty and misty epistemological basement before we can really start doing things. And so he came up with this is based on, he, he actually developed this, I think originally with, with the ideas behind it with Howard Patty, based on, on some ideas from Hertz's work. So what is, a, what is a, a modeling relation? So the point is that we want to understand some or other system in the natural world, right? And let's call this, this the natural system, which is here symbolized by N. So this is the real system that we're trying to understand. And we perceive in this system causalities, things cause each other. So there's a, there's a network of causal entailment within such a system. And that is what we're trying to, to understand and explain. I think explain is the, is the key word here. And so what do we do? We, we find a number of observables within this natural system. Um, and then the idea is to encode these observables. Let's say for a metabolic system, it could be the concentrations of all the metabolic intermediates. Those are your observables. And another observable may be the rate at which they are converted from one to, to the other. Okay, so these are sort of observables that we usually see in a dynamical system. The idea is you encode them into axioms in a formal system, so starting points in a formal system, and then you have a, a, a system of, call it inferential entailment, which you let loose on, on these uh, starting points, and the formal system then gives you a number of predictions. And the idea. Oh, can, can I ask you a question? Because the, the, the term entailment is, is very, very prominent in Rosen, but it's somewhat unfamiliar, especially to biologists. And, and maybe you could say just a one, one or two things about uh, what, what he actually means by entailment here. It's, it's a very formal term. 
It is, it's, it's the reason why he chooses to use entailment and not causality as, as, his, as his general term is that you have different types of causality. So entailment is basically something entails something else, means in a sense it causes that. Yeah? So he reserves the idea of causality, he reserves for natural systems. And so they call it causal entailment. Whereas the type of, 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 let's call it causality that you find in a formal system is through inferences. One thing is inferred from something else, right? And so that is what he then calls an inferential entailment. So he actually uses entailment as a more general term for, let's call it causality uh, in, a, in, a, in a more vague sense. But then he's very specific about causal entailment in a natural system an inferential entailment in a formal system. So it's not a complicated concept. It's just basically how one thing is inferred from something else, from something else or in the natural system, how something causes something else. Without going into the whole philosophical idea of what is causality and so let's, let's not go there now. We may come back to that a bit later. In another um, series of interviews. Yeah. <laughs> but so the important thing is that how do you know whether you, so, so the, what happens in the formal system is then a model of the natural system. That's one term that is used. And what happens in the natural system is a realization of your formal system. But the question is, how good is it? How good is this two-way communication? So the idea is that if you then decode the results of the formal system back into the natural system, and you have a, 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 a so if you follow the, the path C you know, from N to N and you compare it to epsilon, to I, to, to, delta, uh, to delta there, and the two actually are the same. So if you compose epsilon, I, and delta, and it gives you the same results as C, then you have a model that, um, yeah, a model that is a good model, right? Mm -hmm. So I, 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 this is often interpreted as, as a sort of a very um, almost platonic view of, of, of modeling, but, but you can have a different interpretation here, right? You don't have to interpret it this way. It doesn't mean that there are these sort of abstract uh, uh, structures out there. Instead, you can interpret this as uh, formal models um, almost uh, as, as sort of perspectives on, on specific aspects, phenomena that we would yeah. call natural systems, right? I can have many models of the same natural system depending on which observables you choose and depending on what, what type of formalism you use, yeah? So we, of course, use, in, in biology, we're very used to our formal system being a system of, of, of nonlinear differential equations. That's usually 98% of the modeling that happens in, in mathematical biology or bioinformatics biomathematics is that type of formal system, but there are others, like for instance, modeling the relationships in the natural system with category theory, or using a, an ordinary language formal system. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've constructed a linguistic system which models what happens inside the cell as well. So mm -hmm. there are all sorts of possibilities. But the, the, the thing is, are the, the network of causal entailments and the network of inferential entailments, are they mirrors of each other? Do they fit onto each other? And if they do, then you have a good a, a modeling, a good modeling uh, relationship. And so the interesting thing is, uh, people always say, I want to simulate something. What is then the difference between a simulation and a model? And I think that's something that Rosen also very clearly um, talked about in his book. Although unfortunately, and this I always have to say, Rosen was quite ill at the time that, that Life Itself in 1991 was published or was worked up to 1991. And so the, the proofreading of that book is horrendous. There are many, many errors in it, which are not, which are just typos, but, but really confusing. So fortunately, a few people like Cliff Jocelyn and Aloysius Louis have compiled all the errors. And you can find that when you read Life Itself, you actually have this next to you. Uh, but of course, in Louis' books, all these things have been corrected as well. So, so that's not a big problem. But it's unfortunate because that it's always something that people always say, oh, yes, but there's so many errors in the book. Yeah, okay, but it doesn't mean that the book is, you know, that the ideas in the book are wrong. Maybe if you just put the let's next... Dive, 
let's dive into just on this slide, just, just one more remark here that this is not a, a simplistic sort of representational um, philosophy of models, right? So because um, there are these two notions that we're going to go into now. So the model doesn't necessarily, the quality of the model and its predictions don't necessarily mean that it represents some sort of structure that is out there somewhere. And this is, lies at the heart of this distinction between model and simulation, which is often misunderstood. So let's let's uh, talk a little bit about that before we go on. Yeah. So just to the previous point, of course, this is not a sort of platonic idea of a model. This is a constructed model. You construct mm -hmm. the model on, on on the basis of what you in, you know what you observe in your natural system, obviously. But what often happens is that your your model that you construct does not really explain what happens inside the natural system because it's very easy. Let us start with a, with a simulation, with a, with a right-hand diagram. So let us say the mapping F from X to Y is a mapping in your natural system, which you then, and the encoding is this epsilon mapping, yeah, which would then map an observable, which is X into some other variable in your formal system and why the same and then you would have you observe a relationship between x and y so let's for instance say that you have a, you make an experiment where you uh, use different concentrations to measure the rate of an enzyme reaction so you you can you, know, you can plot the points and then you wonder is there a mathematical equation that you can use to simulate those points so what first thing you can do is just put a polynomial through it, yeah, which would be perfect. You can have, you, can, you know, depending on the on the degree of the polynomial, you can do anything. But that polynomial, although it it simulates the behavior, it doesn't explain the behavior because it's not based on anything that happens inside your natural system. It doesn't it? doesn't take into account what is what if the mapping f actually does what it you know what is the fine structure of that mapping and so for instance a beautiful example is for instance out, out of enzyme kinetics i'm going to use lots of biological examples is um, the so-called hill equation so sometimes this relationship between between the concentration of the substrate and the rate of of an enzyme reaction Usually it is a rectangular hyperbola, but sometimes you have a sigmoidal curve as well. So Hill found this when he studied the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. And then he said, well, I want some other mathematical function to, you know, that I can use to, to, to fit the points, which is basically then a fitting procedure, yeah? And he came up with the Hill equation. So again, this is a simulation. It's not based on anything of what happens. It doesn't explain what happens in, 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 the, in the whole complicated thing of, you know, binding of oxygen to hemoglobin and whatever happens in there. So mm. allosteric cooperative effect. So, so, um, so there um, there is an ex there's an example of a simulation where you actually do say curve fitting. Curve it fitting. Yeah, happens. that's the mnemonic. It's, it's yeah. curve fitting. It doesn't Thanks. give you a mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. The idea in a model is that actually, can you see there's no relationship between F and G in the right-hand model? No, there's nothing, you know, but in the left-hand model, the same encoding that you use to encode X and Y must also be used to encode F. So in category theory, this is called a functorial relationship. Epsilon is a functor. It maps observable of objects to objects and it maps mappings to mappings and so in that sense f and epsilon f are related to each other through a particular mathematical function and so with the hill equation what's interesting of course is that we now also have a way of deriving the same equation but not just by curve fitting but by understanding the mechanism so for allosteric enzymes for instance that give a sigmoidal curve so co cooperativity whether it's binding of oxygen to hemoglobin or whether it's binding of some other substrate to an enzyme cooperatively you can write down the mechanism detailed mechanism with with uh, um, elementary reactions and then from there you can derive the hill equation so there you have then an explanation of why it, it has the, you know, this, the, the mathematical structure that it has. In fact, 
fact, Ethel Cornish Bowden and myself de derived the Hill equation for the reversible reaction and for allosteric effects here in the late 90s, where we ex showed exactly how to get to this Hill equation uh, mm -hmm. just by looking at the mechanism. So that's a big difference between a model and a simulation. The model explains, the simulation simulates. <laughs> it, it reproduces the phenomena. And it's an interesting example because, uh, you know, nowadays, I mean, it's sort of very typical, but it, it was decades between Hill uh, just postulating this relationship uh, by curve fitting and, and uh, cooperativity being discovered as the, as the mechanism underneath, um, yeah. which people had suspected, I guess, before, but it took a long time to, to formally um, yeah. uh, derive that. So, so that's extremely important because what we often call it, well, what we call the simulation and dynamical systems theory or systems biology nowadays is, is uh, very often what, what um, uh, Rosen calls a model. And so there's yes. a lot of confusion here. So it's very important to sort of keep in mind simulation. When Rosen talks about that, it's just curve fitting a polynomial, yeah. the Hill function initially uh, without mechanism. That's so great. Rosen would say that um, science is modeling, not simulation, but modeling. Because for him, science is, you know, the, the idea of well, it's coming back to Aristotle, which we'll come to just now, is the, it's asking why, you know, why is something the way it is? What is the underlying uh, mechanism or the underlying causal relationships that make it what it is, that makes it behave the way it does? Mm -hmm. And so for him, science is modeling. And that's a good keyword maybe to, to um, switch to the next topic, which is uh, the, the aim that Rosen has is to formalize the, the, what, what are often called Aristotle's four causes, which are not real uh, causes, but more like you write about them as B causes. The technical term is aitia. Um, um, that's the Greek term that, that Aristotle himself uses, which are more uh, ways of answer, answering the question why than, than causes in the modern sense. And actually we'll come back to that. Only one of Aristotle's causes are usually uh, corresponds to what we usually think of as causes today, right? Could you say a bit more about that? Okay, I, I can and I shall, but perhaps <laughs> let us just look first at how Rosen goes about for, um, depicting a mapping, because that's very important, because you have to have some visual way of describing a mapping. Mm -hmm. So usually, usually if... You, you write f of a gives you b, yeah? but he, he wanted some other visual representation in which f is also a, an entity in your, an entity which is linked to the other um, objects in your description. So in a is Rosen's um, depiction of a mapping. f maps a to b, right? But this is a sort of a graph theoretic form of it. So it's a graph in which F and A and B are all vertices in the graph. The dashed, the dashed arrows show the, is the, the functional part of it and the, and the solid arrows is the, you know, the, 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 the relationship part of it, the relationship between A and B. And of course, in category theory, the idea is that you can now have that um, we call A the domain and B the codomain of the mapping. So it can happen that, for instance, A can be the domain of a mapping, but also the codomain of another mapping. So in B, for instance, A is the codomain of a mapping of G. And so if, if that is true, then you can compose those two mappings into one. That's a very basic you know, part of category theory. But the beauty is that here we can show pictorially we can show how these mappings are related and so maybe give us an example of, of what, what we could think about uh, you know in, in with the body pathway so a is a some other substrate g is an enzyme that converts c into a and a is the substrate for the next reaction when enzyme f converts a into b so that's just a simple what we will call you know, path pathway of material causation it's, it's matter. There's a there's a functional level and there's a material level. Right? So you have C, A, and B are the metabolites being converted into each other, and G and F are yeah. the By enzymes. Enzyme. Yeah, that's a very simple example. Yeah. What rose in one of his major insights was that, of course, there's no reason why F cannot be in the code of, in the codomain of another mapping. So in C, for instance. 
F is an element in the codomain of mapping G, which is, can you see, is completely different. Now you have a, a hierarchy of, of functions. So he called this F is functionally entailed. It's again, if F is an enzyme, then G is the, is the protein, the, the process of protein synthesis that produces the polypeptide that becomes the enzyme. We'll talk about that later. But you can see again, it's a, it's a, it's a level, hierarchical level. And you, you can extend that hierarchy as far as, as you want. You can have something where G is in the codomain of another mapping. And so on, you can have three, four, five, six, infinite regress in, in this hierarchical uh, situation. So that was a very important, it's a word that is often used as, as well as a functional entailment, which is depicted by, by C, by graph C. While, while B in B, we have material entailment, which is like the material flow through the metabolic yeah, path. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the one, that's a, that's a single level of functionality, whereas C is, is a hierarchical level of functionality. Yeah. Of course, B, if you have a sequence, they can close in on itself, so you, and you can form something like graph D, which I suppose is like a, it can be an enzyme. If you look at the detailed enzyme mechanism, it can be that cycle where you know enzyme gets converted into different forms of itself, or it can be something like the citric acid cycle. So the, many of these cycles, these material cycles, form you find in, in metabolism, for instance. But it's again only on one level, right? The H, the F, and the H and the G mapping sit outside the system. They are not entailed from within the system. Whereas in C, F is entailed from within the system. That's very important. So if something happens, let's say something, F is an enzyme and it gets degraded, doesn't matter because there's a process that regenerates it, or not in this case, rep, uh, produces it. Yeah? Yeah. The interesting point comes, and this is the absolutely the most important diagram of all, is C is E, where if you if you look at C, uh, uh, the top left hand uh, the top right hand corner, and you identify G and B, then you form what is called a hierarchical cycle. So can you see this is a it's a strange term because it's a hierarchy. It comes from a hierarchy, but it's a hierarchy that closes in on itself which of course is already strange. Hegel, and I think Hegel is an important philosopher in this whole dialectical uh, website that you are going to put this on. So Hegel already realized this. Kant, of course, also realized this. Jans Jonas realized this. So many philosophers have, have, have struggled with this. The problem is it, it's a logical paradox in a sense because it's an impredicative cycle. So in predicativity, if you, let's say you have a, just a mapping that is in predicative, it means that if you define an object so that it finds itself in a set and the definition quantifies over that set to which that object itself belongs, right? Then you have an impredicate situation. Now, some most of the time it's benign. Let's let's uh, the example I use is you define the smallest fish of all the fish in the pond. Right? So you have the set of fish in the pond, but the object that you're defining, the smallest one, is a member. So is a member of that of that set, right? So you, you have an impredicate situation where you define something. Uh, in terms, of its definition depends of its being in that set. Of course, the, the, the Russell paradox is the, is the famous one, and that's a that's a vicious one, a vicious cycle. But I was just going to say the the fish example is sort of is is, is harmless, yeah, harmless it's right? but it's but uh, this this lies at the the sort of discussions in the early twentieth century about set theory, and and Russell's solution, of course, was his famous barber's uh, paradox. You know, um, the barber. Um, shaves everyone who doesn't shave themselves as the barber shave himself. Um, yeah. That sort of uh, paradox, um, the solution in mathematics and set theory was to simply exclude 
such impredicative um, definitions, uh, yeah. declare them illegal, but we'll come back to why they, they cannot just be included when you study life, right? So this is very important here. Yeah, of course, the, that's one way of doing it is by excluding that. The other way of doing it is by developing set theory to a higher level, which is which this non-well-founded set theory or hyperset theory. Hypersets, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. in which a, a set can be a member of itself. In fact, that's that's the most important bit of, of non, non well founded set theory. But we're not going to go there. <laughs> um, we're going to, but you see what happens in, 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 the, in the hierarchical cycle is F entails G and G entails F. So it's a sort of a collective impredicativity in there, right? So the, the one cannot, you cannot fractionate that, that cycle. I mean, we cannot stress enough how strange this concept is, and it's really hard to grasp. So what is really important here, I think, is to say that it's fundamentally different from what we would uh, call cybernetic sort of regulatory feedback, which is just a, a sort of a, a, a positive or a negative feedback loop. So this is this hierarchical cycle goes f far beyond that because yeah. it, it, it sort of means that F and G, they imply each other and they cannot even exist with each other. Right? Well, if you just have a material regulatory feedback, then um, uh, the process that, that uh, is implementing the feedback can also exist without the feedback. But here you have a situation where, where F cannot exist without G and G cannot exist uh, without F. And it's yeah. a very strange situation. Yeah. Look, at, look at B, for instance. There's no reason why an element in B in set B, now look, I'm talking about diagram B now, huh? the middle one yeah. at the top. There's no reason why an element in set B cannot perhaps affect G, mapping G, which would be like a feedback. But the functional organization of the system is still on one level, yeah. right? It's an informational effect. Whereas in E, you have all the, you can see all the mappings, F and G are part of the cycle. They are entailed from within, which is different from D where you also have a cycle, but F and G and H sit outside. They're not entailed from within. If I take H away, then I can't have a cycle anymore, right? There's nothing course, that, nothing would replace a, it. This but is a strong the, kind of dialectic. Yeah, if F, if I, if I tweak F a little bit, then it can be repaired by G and the other way around as well. So it, it, it's, it's basically Rosen's concept of complexity. He says that any system that contains a hierarchical cycle is what makes it complex. So he distinguishes between simple systems, which do not have such cycles, and complex systems which have such cycles, and we'll see when he, when he defines an organism, he would say that all of the mappings are in such a cycle or in cycles, right? That makes it an organism. But it doesn't it, have to be an organism, right? It can be an ecosystem, for example, can show such cycles. Um, it would if you can show that it's completely close to efficient causation, yeah. The, the economy. They are not, Rosen is not saying they are alive because they, in, in those <laughs> systems, not all the, the relations are like that. But in an organism, we'll come to that later. He says all the relations are like that, right? Rosen would say if all your efficient causes yeah, mm -hmm. are produced from within the system, all of them, so you're close to efficient causation, then you are alive. He says that if we want to know if they're aliens somewhere along the line, no matter on what matter they are based, but they should at least have this organization for us to call them alive. And that is Rosen. I mean, you disagree or agree with him, that doesn't matter. But that That's is the definition. But it could be that a system has many mappings and only some of them are on, on, in, a, in, a, in a hierarchical cycle. That would make them complex, according to Rosen. So that's, for, for example, the ecosystem or the economy. Um, Probably. Like that, Probably. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just to recap this, and this is very important. I mean, first of all, we have now two of Aristotle's causes here. We'll get, we'll get to the rest. Uh, uh, in due time. One is material causation, which is represented by the material flow from, from A to B to C, and uh, Aristotle's efficient causation, which is represented by these functional entailments from F. So on F causing, efficiently causing the con conversion of A to B, um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is this, this uh, 
what is called Rosenian complexity, which is a definition, a very precise definition of complexity, which means any system that has such a hierarchical cycle as shown in, in diagram E is complex in the sense of Rosen, right? That's yeah. a very different um, concept of complexity than the sort of gradual, more vague definition that complexity theorists themselves are using, where um, complexity is more like it's, it's very complicated, right? There's lots of factors, lots of uh, heterogeneous nonlinear interactions in a system. So that is important to stress. Rosen's type of complexity is, is very different and is very precisely defined. You're either complex or you're not. Um, exactly. You cannot be somewhere in between which the other concept yeah. of complexity is more gradual. It's a degree, yeah. you can have a degree of complexity, which is not possible here. Now, okay. You're either simple or you're complex. Right. And simple yeah. can become complicated, but that make, doesn't make it complex. So, <laughs> so if, if you want to read up about this a little bit, Roberto Poli, mm -hmm. from he's written quite a few papers that also this difference between complicated and complex and simple, of course, but uh, uh, using the, the Rosenian framework. So well, I find again, it extremely useful. I find it completely convincing. We'll provide uh, references below. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Okay, so this this is sort of the major step, right? And to just come back um, to life. Uh, so a living system is a system is a complex system with the additional conditions that all of its efficient causations are caused uh, in in such closed loops. So it's close to efficient. There is closure to efficient causation, and that is called uh, Rosen's uh, conjecture very often, right? That, that living systems are defined, and only living systems are defined by this particular dialectic structure, right? Exactly. Now, look, it's the same idea as, as Maturana and Varela's autopoiesis, which is just not as... Rosen was the one that took this much further and, and formalized it. Um, Maturana and Varela were much more vague about it. Um, and they also had the additional condition. So you have to be self-producing, which is the mm -hmm. same as being if close to efficient predation. But they also said you have to be self-identifying um, in the sense that you have to, you know, distinguish yourself from the rest of the environment in some way. Bounding. Cell does yeah. um, but in principle, it's the same, same idea. Um, it's not only Rosen. Of course, Maturan and Varela are the others, you know, ones that, that, that have postulated this idea as well. Maybe if you, if you go to the next slide, we just come back to... Okay, so, so before we go to the... Isn't there a slide that talks about the input-output story? Where is that? There, this one. Let's go non-linear here, too, in the, in the slides. That's totally fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My... Um, okay, let us, we can come back to the previous slide, but here, right. here is just the idea that, you know, you have to think of this mapping, it's, here's a category theory, sort of graph theoretic formulation, but you have to think of it in terms of, of, of something. So think of F as a processor. You can think of it as hardware, for instance, or an enzyme or something like that, that acts on an input to give you an output. So that is a unit of function. That is what Rosen thought about, you know, it's a functional unit. And these functional units are in a sense related to each other, coupled to each other. So here we have the idea that, that the, the, the processor is the efficient cause. And the input would be then the material cause for the effect. So the, the output is the effect of this whole functional unit. And the int A would then be the material cause and B would be the effect. B can be the material cause for something else again in the, in the second mapping. That's no problem with that. And the way that he brought final cause into it, and I, I, I don't want to go into this because really you have to add more mappings to, to understand final, final cause in a, in a sort of more understandable way. But, but here, the only in, in this particular mapping, if that is the system, the, the, the effect is the final cause of the efficient cause and the material cause, right? So in a sense, it's, a, it's in the reverse direction. Mm. So if you, on the next slide. Shall we go back? No, 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 first, first to, to the next slide. Go further, okay, yeah. yes. So you can see what happens here. Now, so if you have this impredicative hierarchical cycle, you can translate it into efficient cause acting on material force to give you efficient. And so, so you have fine, but if the 
material cause is the final cause of the efficient one. You can replace it by final. So you can see here on the, on the right hand side, the system is not only close to efficient causation, it's also close to final causation. So basically, if, you're, if you have closure to efficient causation, the final cause is equal to the, the, the totality of the efficient causes yeah. in the system. So yeah. when we come back to so, the organism, we can say the, the, the final cause of the organism is the organism itself. Itself, yeah. precisely, right. Okay, so, so this so, is... So this for is me, a good point to go mm -hmm. back to the, the, this yeah. slide, I guess. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here is the beginning, and we're going to spend a whole session on this idea of a metabolism repair system and, and how to realize that and, and you know, how to understand that. But you can see it's a very simple idea is you have this functional entailment hierarchy, this two level hierarchy. And all that you, if you, there's no reason why you cannot say, well, C and B are of the same thing. Um, they, they're both objects, they could, could very well be the same thing. And this gives you this mapping on, on the system on the, on the right-hand side, which Rosen called the metabolism repair system. So the idea is that, that the metabolic processor, let's say that the whole metabolic processing unit, yeah, intermediate metabolism, can be symbolized by F, which then acts on some nutrients that come from the outside, A, um, to give you B. So the system is open to material causation. That's very important. Eh? Also thermodynamically, it has to be open. Otherwise the system will never be able to, you know, go to some other steady state. That's uh, very important, right? Closure yeah. to efficient causation can only happen, in fact, in, if you're open uh, to material flow and thermodynamically uh, to energy flow open yeah. as well. So you have to have, this is, you have to be thermodynamically open to get closure to, to efficient causation, which is confusing sometimes to people. I'm, I'm not, I have to think about this because if you think if, let's say you have a system, a system which is close to efficient causation and you let it go to equilibrium, mm -hmm. then actually this, then, then that system is close to, to material causation as well. But nothing is happening, of course. If the system goes to equilibrium, <laughs> it's dead. You're dead, yes. Yeah. You're not alive. We have to, we'll revisit that, I think, in part yeah. three, when we, when we talk about the, the importance of, of kinetics versus thermodynamic um, uh, sort of approaches. Um, and so let's, let's let that rest. Yeah. I mean, but, what's, but, what's but really important right, right here is that, so if you look at this diagram on the right, um, F is sort of the, the, the totality of metabolism and it's, it's a product of metabolism, of material flow of metabolism itself. So that's that material arrow going from B up to F. Yeah. Uh, I, in the end, you'll see, we, I call it the covalent, it's covalent catalysis. It's all the covalent reactions. G, of course, then is using the end products of metabolism. And I'm not going to define what they are because this is quite, quite, con controversial in a sense. You can choose whatever you like as B, but the idea is that whatever you choose as B, G acts on it to replace F. So Rosen <laughs> called it the repair, yeah. but perhaps a better word, which was suggested by the Letelier Cornish Bowden group, is perhaps to use a replacement. Because so of the course- the enzymes it, are replaced. Yeah, yes, enzymes nice. get degraded and then they get replaced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But whether you call it repair, as long as you know what you're talking about, it doesn't really matter what word you use. And F, of course, is the metabolism component. Yeah. So you end up with a metabolism repair system yeah. that is not yet close to efficient correlation no, because the point. it is outside the system, yeah. But Rosen's point, and I, and, and I, I absolutely agree with him, all models of any cell must at least have this structure in it this abstract structure that you know, captures a part of the functional organization of the cell, yeah. that must be there. So we're going to talk a lot about, about G <laughs> and what it is and how it, how it gets regenerated in the system because there, there we have a problem. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about later is not about the modeling, but about the realization of the model. Yeah, so that's a biochemist, that's the interesting thing. You know, I want to, there must be a model, it must be realized in, in what we know. After that's an interesting. Years of biochemistry, 120 years of biochemistry. So that's an integral part of, of Rosen's modeling relation diagram. But um, what you could maybe say is that neither he nor Louis um, 
did a lot of work on that part of the actualization, um, a lot of effort to, to sort of see how the, 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 the scheme could be, this sort of scheme could be actualized in it. And, and that's where, where your work comes in. And we're going to talk yeah. about, uh, plenty about that in the, in the second part. Yeah. Um, so just as a, as a sort of a spoiler to start off with, the, um, it's, the way that they, it's the way that they then found a mapping that, that actually re replaces G. Yeah. That was impossible to realize, and that's where <laughs> they stopped trying. Uh, so, and nobody, else, nobody else had been able to do that either. That's because their model is just, I mean, when you say it, it's wrong. The, the, the devil is in, in the detail. Nothing, it's fine, but biologically, it's nonsense. That's a good point to, to come back and remind us that, that these, are, these diagrams are, are deceptively simple. And often people get confused because they sort of intuitively think they're equivalent to, you know, standard network diagrams in systems biology, where the arrows are, are representing specific processes, uh, which is not the case here. So these category theory mappings is, are very high level and they hide a lot of complexity. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one in particular, that's, it's a nice example here. Think of how, how, would, how would you model this particular diagram on the right hand side? So let us think of A and B being states. Mm -hmm. Uh, concentrations or whatever you want, well, yeah, many types of states, but let's say concentrations. How do you go, and F is a function, yeah? So how do you go from a state to a function? How do you model the, 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 the transition from a state to a function? In principle, we can't do that. Mm. There's no mathematics that allows you to take a state. And so in a sense, you've got B, the concentration, and F is the enzyme rate equation. You, you cannot... Mm, you know, you cannot understand how to get from a, a concentration to a rate equation. That is, but it happens inside the cell, and and I'll show later why why this is possible. Because there is a, it is a state. B can be, for instance, a different type of state. It could be a sequence in a, of amino acids in a polypeptide, and we know that that polypeptide can fold up into an active protein. So the point is that, that biologically it's possible. But mathematically, you have a problem if you want to go from a state to, a, to an operator. Rosen was very explicit about this in a 1989, a 1989 paper called The Role of Necessity in Biology, where he explained this very nicely. He said, this is where a big problem lies. If you're going to use a system of differential equations, then you, you cannot model this because yeah. there's no way that you can generate a rate function within such a system. So, so this is... Part two will be a lot about this, but I guess before we can get there, we need to add some complexity to the formalism as well. And this is where your own work comes in. You have been worried about how to integrate the, the one missing Aristotelian cause into the system. And uh, maybe that's a, uh, how we should end this first part by introducing your notions of, of uh, uh, formal causes in, this, in, this in these diagrams. Yeah, because Formal cause has, is the one that was conspicuously absent from everybody's work. Rosen himself, he mentions it here and there, and in that 1990, 1989 paper, he actually does mention formal cause and, and, and one way of, of, of incorporating it. Um, unfortunately, that way is the one that we don't want to go, and we'll get to that because that led to his idea of a logical paradox in von Neumann's uh, constructor theory, which we'll get to. But formal cause, which up to now has, has not appeared in any of our diagrams, is absolutely crucial to the discussion. I mean, for, for a biologist, formal cause is so bloody obvious that you have to, you have to talk about it. It's about formal causes, DNA. Um, but the question is, how do we then in this formalism and in these diagrams, how do we incorporate formal cause in a useful way? And it turns out that you can do it in four ways. And I've depicted only three of them here because the fourth way is the one that actually is not very useful. But the, the one way that formal cause, well, two of them, A and B, show that formal cause and efficient cause, or let's say that the formal cause and the mapping, formal cause would be the sigma. They actually act together. So you have to think of them as a unity. So for an enzyme, for instance, if you think of an enzyme, the active site is actually, of course, the important bit. The active site does two things. 
It has the, the, the chemical architecture that allows the, the catalysis to take place. So it's catalytically active, yeah? And it's very specific. It's catalytically specific as well. What type of reaction it will catalyze? That depends on some residues, amino acid residues, side chains in the active site. But it also determines what, what it acts on and what product it will form, right? So if you think of A as the substrate of an enzyme and B as the product, then in a sense, what will happen to the substrate is already encapsulated in the specificity of the active site. It binds that particular substrate and then converts it to a product. So if I want to talk about, I'm going to read here because and now I've got it, let's click here. I'm going to read just a, 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 because it's so important to have the right words for the formal course. So what is the formal course? Sorry, if my head goes up, I'm reading up here. It's the answer to the question, what is it to be something? So efficient cause is the answer to what, what makes something, right? What is the processor, the agent or so that produces? The, the material cause is what is it made out of, right? The formal cause is then what is it to be that something? And the final cause is what is it, what is the purpose of that? What is it made for? So what is it to be something? What does that mean? It's, it's, it, the, the answer to that would be the sense of being the actualization of some prior model, which is the formal cause of that something. Uh, to be something is, to, is the sense of being the actualization of some prior model. The model being used in very broad sense. I mean, could anything it could be a mental or concrete image, an idea, a propensity, a design, a blueprint, a template, a program, a mold, a pattern, even a prior exemplar of that something. It's just that they exist somewhere physically or in mentally or so, or in the case of an enzyme in the active site, a, 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 you know, specific architecture, which is the model that is actualized in the end. So in that sense, if you think about, about I always use Michelangelo's David as an example. So what is the formal cause of David? Well, it must be some idea in Michelangelo's head, which he then probably had drawings of, yeah? which in the end is then actualized in the marble when he's the efficient cause, obviously my, Michelangelo, it's actualized in the marble of the, you know, cutting out the David out of the marble block. But so it's, it's, it's just a blue, the blueprint idea. metaphor, right? The, the blueprint yeah, yeah. on an architecture, the blueprint of a house would yeah. be the form of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. So it, so, because people often confuse this. this is, so it's what makes David, David, not just a, any, of, any of Michelangelo's statues. It's that particular statue, the formal cause um, for it is, is the idea or, the, or the, the image or the drawings that he made that are actualized as the, as the effect in the end. So that is one way of, so for an enzyme, a biological in, uh, uh, example, an enzyme, the specificity, the substrate specificity, and of course, product specificity in that sense, um, is the formal cause. Whereas the, cat, you know, the catalytic machinery is the efficient cause. And it's but, in this case, it's wrapped into the structure. So it's not different. It's determined by the structure of the protein. So that's why you have this formalism where you say F sigma is the same. It's same it, it, same it makes the F specific, but yeah. it's in the F, right? Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, in, it's in, embedded in the F. It's like you have a family of functions and you have a choice function that says, well, I'm not I'm from this family, I choose that particular one. Yeah. But of course, it's possible that these are two separate physical entities as well, physical, you know, separate entities. And then um, it would be the two together that act. So for instance, if you have a, a amino acyl tRNA, which gets uh, polymerized into a polypeptide, that's done by mRNA and a ribosome working together. The, the mRNA obviously gives the information about the amino acid sequence, and the ribosome is the catalytic that, that, that actually does the coupling. But the two are separate entities, but none of them on their own can do anything. They can only do something if they are combined. 
So mathematically, that sigma f would be an element in the Cartesian product of all the possible sigmas and all the possible f's. So the family of f's and the family of sigmas. If you have a Cartesian product of the two, which of course are all the possible pairs, then one of those would be, for instance, the sigma f that acts on a to give you b. So that's a nice example again, which will be pertinent to my own model. Uh, and then the last one, and that's an interesting one, because here you have a situation where the formal cause is actually embedded in the material cause. So that the, the efficient cause F just sort of blindly does what it has to do. But it, it, what it triggers, happens, yeah. yeah. What actually happens, the information for what actually happens is embedded in the material in the material cause yeah and so the beautiful example here is that you have an unfolded polypeptide so just a string of amino acids it's non-functional doesn't do anything but what distinguishes it from all the other similar strings of amino acids it is the sequence in which the amino acids are coupled together that's the information that is embedded in the polypeptide and it's that information that determines when this when when it folds into a functional protein. It's that amino acid that sequence that determines what the three-dimensional structure will be in the end. So, so this change the amino acid sequence, the the conformation, three-dimensional conformation of the protein will, will change. This reminds me of discussions about the specific the specificity of cell signals as well. Is it in the in the in the signal itself, or is it in the in the response of the cell? Right, and and lately people have been focusing again much more on the response of the cell where is where is the 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 specificity is it's not clear but uh, for a long time yeah. people had assumed that it must be in the signal but it, it may not actually be it may be in the no, way that the, no, the specificity responds. lies in the code so yeah. this is a completely different example from this so between this extracellular signal the, the first messenger and the second messenger inside the cell there sits a translator a code yeah. So, for instance, there's a receptor, and on the one side there's a specific binding. But what happens on the other side? It's got nothing. You know, it has to do with the, what, what, how the receptor translates. It is it, yeah, is it something that makes cyclic AMP, for instance, or is it something that that that, that phosphorylates tyrosine? They, they all sorts of different. So this is between in this mapping. There's no code. There's nothing. There's no translation mechanism from from sequence to for unfolded sequence to folded three-dimensional structure. So that's a big difference what you mentioned there. It's very important, but here you have no organic code sitting between the two, sitting between A and B. So what would the, what in this case, so, so in this case, what, what is the agent? What allows this to happen? And, and I'll make a strong case for it. It's the intracellular because this is non-covalent. This is supramolecular chemistry. And the agent that allows it to happen is the very particular context in which it happens. In this case, the intracellular milieu. We have the correct pH, you have the correct ionic strength, you have the sort of a, a sometimes important the, the, the protein concentration, crowding, molecular crowding situation. All these things together create an environment that allows it to function. It must be watery, for instance. You cannot have the function, the, the, the thing in chloroform. Yeah, because yeah. one of the major driving forces is exactly the hydrophobic effect, which is an effect which is from the outside, from water side. It's not um, non-polar molecules don't aggregate because they like each other. It's because water pushes them together in order in order to maximize its own entropy. So, so, so what's really important here to stress is that intracellular milieu, of course, is a system level. Um, uh, cellular level variable. And, and again, this is not the same as the hierarchical complexity that Rosen points out. These, these are different levels of organization. So we can, we can choose the, the, the variables of these diagrams to be at different levels of organization, which is still not the same as this hierarchical uh, complexity of functional entailment. These are two different things. And I, I guess we're gonna come back. We have just started to unpack the complexity um, behind these these maps and we've started building up a formalism by which we can um, capture them mathematically but uh, I think this is a good point uh, we should wrap up the first part of our discussion here uh, by sort of saying we have we now have the formal tools 
to go and see how much of the organization of a cell can we formalize and how can we capture that um, uh, within this sort of formalism. And we'll see that that's not obvious. And uh, also as a teaser for the next discussion, you will argue that Rosen got it slightly wrong. So, but before we go into that, uh, we'll take a, a, a break and uh, I hope that we'll see you again uh, in the next part uh, of our discussion, which will focus on um, Rosen's particular um, uh, model of, of a cell and we'll bring it back to biochemistry and biology. So thank you very much, Yanni, for this uh, warm up. Now we just, we just got started and we'll have two more parts coming uh, that discuss the relevance of Rosen's work for uh, current day biology and then the implications uh, for the future. So thank you and I hope to see you again soon.